a mad race through Southern California for money. Who will win? We discuss this and more on today's episode. I didn't really have anything like thematic to say. There's not a lot of themes to this. <laughs> There's one theme and it hits the note for the entire film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about uh, unusual and out of the ordinary literature. And sometimes I even talk about uh, uh, movies and films with my friend Lucas from the Bits of Lit. Hello there, Lucas. Hello there. Uh, yeah, so um, as per usual, we talk about movies once per month, uh, and uh, for this month, uh, I talked about, or I, I chose, um, it's a mad, 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 mad world for Mads, <laughs> which is uh, important to, to point out. I don't know why they had that many Mads. I think it's just a funny title, uh, but this was made in 1963. It was directed by Stanley Kramer, uh, known for making uh, heavy sort of, as he called them, message films, uh, which are just like big dramas. Uh, heavy handed. He, he was known for Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, uh, The Defiant Ones, both movies about uh, race um, and uh, a couple of other movies. Uh, this was also written by William and Tanya Rose, a husband and wife duo. Uh, they would also uh, write uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner um a, a notable movie for the time and it's it's starring a huge cast of people uh including spencer tracy um as the as officer culpepper sid caesar as uh the aptly named melville uh and uh ethel merman among many 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 others including the three stooges for some reason even though they don't even feel like they belong in this movie <laughs> they're just there and this isn't yeah. even prime like three stooges this is end of the end of the line like th they got a couple years left three stooges i uh, yeah i believe uh two of them died in the 70s so this was i guess 10 years before larry and mo died i think curly the bald one uh lived till the 90s i think mm. or late 80s so yeah they're just there for five seconds as a gag which is Pretty much the entire movie, uh, gag after gag after gag, one theme, one note, one way to explore that theme, one note, uh, the entire way through of this runtime. I think it's mad, 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 mad. Oh, that's kind of cool. The cameras are thick. Sorry. I think it's mad, 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 mad world because it makes you feel four different levels of mad, mad at the movie mad like you're going crazy and two other mysterious forms of madness <laughs> <laughs> yeah it it does feel like that um but i should also point out that we watched two different versions of the movie uh yeah i watched the two and a half hour version and apparently and there's the, another version out there that's uh how long th three hours and 17 minutes that is ridiculous. I don't. I don't know what more they could add uh, to the movie. Like it's already over long, in my opinion. So what more do they have to say? Like for me, like the, the Three Stooges showed up for a gag that was like three seconds long. Like it, the camera panned to them uh, at the airport, and it, it was like it made some like quaint noise for the for yeah. the music, and then we never saw them again. It yeah, was they like, didn't do anything. Yeah, there was like, no. What was, what was the point? What was the point of a lot of this? <laughs> All of a lot of the gags. Uh, I, for the version that I watched, uh, it was pretty easy to tell. Uh, basically, um, like there was the parts of the film that you saw that were clear and crisp and you know seventy millimeter high definition, ultra definition, or whatever. Uh, and then there were the parts that maybe like weren't color corrected or whatever, because there was like a sudden change in the way that um, that it looked like there was like a kind of um, a, like a weird film or grain over it or something, I guess, because it hadn't been worked on yet. Or, or I don't know why. Um, and it was just like a whole bunch of scenes that got extended. And sometimes there were parts, there were scenes where there was audio, but there was n there were just like pictures of what, like uh, principal photography or something like that, of like what they wanted to do. Um, I don't think they added anything. They just kind of 
continued some jokes or like tried to fill in some gaps about like what the characters were doing just so like you know for example like um the the couple that gets trapped in the the warehouse not the warehouse the equipment mm -hmm. building um there's a gag a gag or two that only has audio um I, i'm forgetting what the joke is now but you know you don't see them for a long time in the movie but then there's this scene but you don't actually see them still i guess because it wasn't filmed or it, the 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 film part got stuck or destroyed or i don't know what but you have the audio so they acted it out i'm not sure what but it, it just added 47 more minutes or whatever of comedy <laughs> The story is pretty simple, as you introduced at the beginning. Uh, some guy is speeding through a highway through the mountains. Uh, and uh, well, let me let me let me just cut you off there. I oh, what yeah. I really love is how this movie starts the way all all beautiful comedies do with an act with like a well filmed action scene. <laughs> I before that I don't know if your film your version had this, but actually it starts before that with this really amazing like animation with the song like it's a mad 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 world i don't remember how they sing it you, did your version have like the colorful animation at the beginning to give you uh, all the characters and stuff it was like a black that? screen on amazon oh uh, okay well i saw some like really beautiful colorful um mm. uh, stuff i guess maybe that was something that got cut and for good reason, because it was five fucking minutes. <laughs> There's no, and uh, maybe five and a half, because it was like five, I think five minutes of this animation, which was pretty cool, but it was like introducing the hundreds of different actors uh, and like, you know, uh, cameos that are in the film. It was a great animation. Uh, and then it went to a black screen, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, which then opened on uh, an action sequence, which I'll let you describe. Uh, it was actually really well filmed. And, and that, that'll be something that I compliment about this movie a lot. Uh, like, there there's a uh, there's a couple of people driving on a highway and then some some dude is like driving like precariously, like passing them and uh, driving dangerously close to the edge. And then finally, like there's an amazing stunt that takes place again a common theme throughout the movie where he does the the dude just drives off the cliff uh and um does a flip uh and his car kind of crashes uh the people stop yeah. and somehow the man was thrown from the car but is still yeah. alive <laughs> i one of my favorite uh questions i don't remember if it was in one of the cut parts that you might not have seen was like when um all of our um, ensemble cast of men, at least, comes down, or most of them, because we we meet a few more uh, people who join the rat race later. Uh, but uh, one of my favorite questions, I think one of them just asks, like, hey, buddy, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> the guy is just like... I fell off of I fell off a cliff and was thrown out of my car. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot how we how we worded it, but that got a good laugh out of me. And, you know, at that point, I was like, okay, we had a cool animation, weird long black screen, great action little little action sequence here. That joke landed pretty well. Uh, there were a few others, but um, then I believe the police show up. Uh, mm -hmm. And the our, a, a lot of our primary ensemble cast are trying to figure out what to do. Should they fall? Oh, I should say uh, this old man who's thrown out of his car is speaking somewhat cryptically mm -hmm. and saying like, uh, you know, there, basically he says there's treasure south of San Diego in, in some um, park uh, under a big W, which you can't miss. Does he say uh, south of San Diego? Because they are absolutely 100 percent in los angeles oh yeah you're right you're right sorry i i yeah south of los angeles yeah they're in los angeles but um it's like 
I got confused because I saw the map and I thought, oh, that's where San Diego is. But no, San Diego is further south. My fault. <laughs> no, I think the movie's a bit unclear about it because Culpepper looks at a map at one point and is like looking at Mexico and San Diego, even though they might have just like filmed in Los Angeles and not expected anyone to notice. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it had to be like it had to be Los Angeles they filmed in. Uh, but I think it had to be San Diego because San Diego is closer to the border and that ties in with his plan at the end uh, to escape, right? Um, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. So I thought it was south of San Diego because of that. But you're right. It did look like Los Angeles. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, anyway, the police, was it the police or people like chasing him who were like covering up? I thought it was the police. Yeah, no, it was the it was the police. They were yeah. Tasked they with, report like, to Culpepper, right? Smiler, Smiler Grogan, which is his weird name. Um, uh, that name they, he needs to make a comeback. <laughs> they know he he stole money and then like he buried it, and so they've been tasked with finding like tracking him, finding that the money. But he snuck out a window, eluded them, and man, mm. and was just suddenly driving like. Yeah, that whole story did did not make me feel like they were police at all. I thought they were, like, at least at first, okay, yeah, they showed up in police garb and so on and so forth. But I don't think we saw their cars. So I was just thinking, like, the story they tell about this guy escaping out of a, like, hotel room or whatever, of the window, uh, just made me think that he was, like, some kind of gambling addict or something and these were part of like an la mafia or something mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, yeah they were the i guess well they work for the police so it's a different kind of mob they specifically <laughs> reference culpepper so i i think yeah yeah, yeah yeah you're right you're right but i yeah i got a little confused just when they showed up then i realized oh no they were police uh but i was a little confused about maybe they were uh I guess early, like early on, I thought they were part of a mob. And then I thought, oh, no, they're part of a mob that's working with Culpepper. And then I realized, no, they're just the police. And then I realized, oh, that's still a mob. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I'm and being... then, so yeah, everyone learns about the money. Uh, and then they, uh, they, um, they, 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 like they initially, they're, they're like, well, we're just going to go our separate ways. Uh, mm -hmm. but they all kind of watch each other. Uh, speed up and then slow down uh, like the first 20 minutes of this movie is just them driving on a highway eventually stopping uh, they tell the police that they they don't know anything about what he what he said um, mm -hmm. but then they because uh, they don't want to be stuck there like giving a report all day they all have different things that they're doing like one of them is on mm -hmm. their honeymoon another mm -hmm. one is driving with their mother and their their wife or their, their mother-in-law and their wife um Another one's driving like furniture across the state, uh, but they 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 eventually stop and they're like, okay, we can like they have this very elaborate kind of conversation about uh, uh, like how they can uh, they they can go find the money and then like divide the shares. Uh, and they mm -hmm. start by saying they want to like give it up, like break it up all evenly, and then they make a joke about like separate shares for how you, how how involved you were with the whole thing. Yeah. And, they don't like that either so they're just like fine we're all just going to go our separate ways and whoever gets the money first wins yeah i thought it was pretty funny the way that they were trying to calculate it to try to make it even the only thing i didn't really like is like actually she did a pretty good job but one problem i have with the movie is that everyone is such a like caricature they're not actually like real people um mm -hmm. like the the man with the is that Melville, the man with the wife and the stepmother? That's um, not Melville. That's I. I forgot his name. He's a. Um, he's the sea edible seaweed guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Melville is the one that gets stuck in under in the basement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but that guy, like, he was kind of like a super indecisive person, and like, that was his whole joke. Like somebody would say something and he'd agree to that. And then somebody would say something else and he would agree to that. And like, it was kind of funny at first when they were like arguing about this. But then the other joke, other main joke there was that 
Uh, his stepmom is a huge crank and won't stop screaming at everybody. <laughs> uh, which yeah. I thought she did a really great job with her role, but it, it just was like, that's her only personality. And that's everybody, like the personality th that you see them like perform at first uh, is the entire personality they have throughout the whole movie. Uh, except maybe Culpepper. Yeah, I think that's He's... the nature of the movie, uh, given how long it is, uh, and and the and like what it's about, because uh, it's not really, um, it's not really, it's not really about the characters. It's more about the antics. Yeah, it's all hijinks and mayhem, and I guess about like, I guess there is a deeper theme of like people will do anything to rip each other apart uh, to to benefit themselves, especially when huge amounts of money uh is on the line interesting theme uh three hours and 17 minutes is, of a slapstick comedy is not the way to go about it <laughs> yeah when i when i was looking this up on wikipedia like they were talking about and i, I looked up stanley kramer and they were saying that he was uh like he was known for his message films and like they were talking about the other ones, but then they came to this one and they're like, Oh, it's about greed. I'm like, this one's not about greed. This one barely has any like things to say. It, I thought it was more like, ha ha, look at all this. Isn't it funny? It's not trying to be like, this is what greed does to people. Like it causes them to like steal airplanes and like blow up buildings. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure. <laughs> and, uh, cause fights with, um, uh servicemen that destroy their business entirely <laughs> that was actually uh, the my favorite part of the movie i'll say same i love that part it was so ridiculous mm -hmm. uh, it has some redeeming qualities i think but like whether it's two and a half hours or over three hours it hits one note look at how funny these people are for being so greedy the entire time so yeah. So some of the stuff they do in the movie is that they uh they charter airplanes. Uh yeah. one of them uh like gets a ride from a man named uh Lieutenant Lieutenant Hawthorne, uh who is a British uh military man who's studying the flora of uh of I guess Southern California. Yeah. Um What's interesting about this, it's something the movie doesn't mention, but it's an accidental detail about it. Given that he's in the military at this time, he is more than likely participating in uh, stifling some uh, colonial revolutions that are taking place. Uh, like it doesn't, it doesn't like outright say that, but it's the implication is there. Yeah, I could see that. Oh my, didn't think about that at all. Hmm. <laughs> He was probably my favorite character. I mean, he was another, he's not really a character. He's just a caricature to make British jokes about. Um, but I did love him and the seaweed guy when, when they lost the wife and the mom. Um, Cause the mom, the uh, stepmom wanted to call, what was their, her son's name? Uh, Valentine? No, not Valentine. I forgot his name, yeah. but they eventually got sick of her and, he was so greedy he left them and uh then they just start ripping on each other for being british and american <laughs> yeah hawthorne specifically says that american men are uh emasculated. effeminate yeah and it's he says the same thing that modern conservatives say about mary yeah that was like the least like that part just wasn't funny at all actually um like yeah he's ripping on american men for being emasculated and effeminate and they they're like slaves to their women unlike british men i guess <laughs> and i guess that was supposed to be funny because we've seen the stepmom be a huge crank and the the wife be like totally demure and just like listen to what my mom says do what she says uh obviously it wasn't funny uh, but then, like, uh, I just love that guy's response. Like, now, wait a second. Are you saying something about this free country right now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was pretty funny to me. That was pretty dumb. Anyway, uh, I get 
there's a whole bunch of hijinks. There's a lot of stealing. There's a lot of people who lose their vehicles. They get destroyed. There's a lot of cars that get destroyed in this in yeah. this movie. <laughs> a lot. An unprecedented amount of cars are destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> I I love that. Yeah. Like, I don't like this movie personally. I think it's so boring. But there are so many interesting things about it. Like, for one... Why is this a slapstick comedy for three over three hours or two and a half hours? That is impressive to even have the idea to do that. It doesn't work, but I love the audacity. Two, it's in 70 millimeter. It looks amazing <laughs> for this. <laughs> that had like to be of expensive. all things to film in 70 millimeter, <laughs> like you film like the a silly like rat race clone. Well, Rat Race is a clone of this, but yes. Wait, uh, Rat Race is a clone of this? Is is there a Rat Race that came before this? There, I, I believe there was one in the fifties that that had. Um, oh, okay, okay. I, I, I'm Matra, only thinking. I yeah, you might be right. Okay, it's a clone of Rat Race. Then I was thinking of the one with Whoopi Goldberg and John Lovitz, uh, which again is not a good film either, but it has some good moments too. But we're not talking about that. It has some funny things. Uh, Okay, yeah, it's a clone of Rat Race. So, and even if it stands on its own and it's not a clone of an original Rat Race movie or whatever, like the audacity of filming this on, in 70 millimeter in the deserts of California um, is just insane to me because it looks beautiful. Um, and the action scenes are amazing in this movie. And, and the like, car there's... chases are like modern. They mm -hmm. feel like they could be in a movie now. It's constantly ch changing from something that was done in a studio with a backdrop to yeah. like an actual on scene um, uh, kind of like uh, on location. I mean, uh, type yeah. of scene, which is which is cool. Uh, you can kind of notice the difference. Maybe you wouldn't be able to notice um, at, at the time. And then there's like this one scene. Like I'm moving ahead, um, but like. Uh, there's a scene where they're in a radio t uh, tower and there's an a the airplane is coming at the tower and it looks remarkably well done for the time. Yeah, that part with the airplane with Mickey Rooney and the idiot, I forgot his name, but <laughs> that's his character. He's stupid and, and that's it. <laughs> um, I didn't really find, like, I thought the the alcoholic pilot was funny. And when they knock him out, or when he gets knocked out initially, that was pretty funny. And then the rest of them just like screaming, not very funny, because it just goes on so long. And then they go to other people, and then they come back to them, and they're still doing the same stuff. Uh, I like, but yeah, the when they're in the, uh, what is that called? The radio central station? Thing? Radio tower. Yeah, the radio tower. That was incredible. Like the, the flying... That had to be real, right? You like, it looked real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it was. I believe it was real. It looked real enough to me. And if it wasn't, well done. That was very well done. But I loved the like radio tower. Like, got the guy they brought in to like uh, be the expert to explain how to um, land the, the ship, and he got tied up in all the wires somehow, some way. And then he falls out of the tower and is hanging. I thought that yeah, was pretty funny. That's funny. This is where the three stooges show up, by mm -hmm. the way. And then, okay, cool to see them. I would have liked to see them do something. Mm -hmm. But whatever. I thought, uh, like, because you told me you watched a three-hour version. And I thought, well, are they going to do anything else? And then I was like, okay, well, I guess they do more in a three-hour version because nope. there's nothing they do here. Nope. They're literally there for a three, five, three to five second gag, which is a shame. Remarkable waste. Maybe they couldn't afford to make the get the three stooges to like do more. I mean, they could afford a small cameo, but you know, they probably even at the end of their careers or whatever, probably. I mean, they spent a lot of money on that 70 millimeter is what I'm saying. And mm -hmm. the other hundreds of people that are in this movie. And again, think of how many cars were destroyed in this movie. <laughs> the budget had to be exploding. 
uh, and the producers could not have been happy. Oh, there's a couple other other than the British guy. There's the Zillman. There's, yeah, Silman, the Jewish guy. I think that that seemed to be his entire personality. It felt weird. Yeah. Again, there's so many. I guess he he's not quite a stereotype, uh, but he's a very strong character caricature of a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> in the worst ways. So the he's way he's introduced is he, uh, like, the truck driver, like, has to ride a bicycle. Uh, and he gets into a car with Zillman because he hitchhikes. And then, uh, like, he tells Zillman about the money. And Zillman's like, wow, that sounds interesting. They, uh, like, then he, then he like, gets uh, the truck driver to get out of the car and just drives off. Which is, yeah. which is already funny. Oh, because uh, he says, like, oh, if you leave the bike in the middle of the road, someone will hit it in the night. <laughs> what a fucking idiot. <laughs> oh, God. That, again, there are, like, some funny jokes here and there, but it's just, like, not consistent. And a lot, of, I, I don't know, uh, a lot of the time it's not even the slapstick that's funny. It's just, like a a well written or well delivered line, like mm -hmm. yeah, when he gets the truck driver to go out, when the guy, truck driver does go out, it's really funny that he believes that, <laughs> and he looks like he believes it. Yeah, Zillman, I think he's, I guess he's quite obviously like the worst. I think he is actually maybe he is a kind of stereotype. I mean, he doesn't have like, I guess he's like the most greedy because. I know we're like skipping around. There's not much to talk about with this movie other than like different gags. Mm -hmm. So sorry if anyone was looking for like, let's go all the way through the whole story. The whole story is these idiots do stupid things in Southern California <laughs> to get money. But uh, uh, Zillman, like when he's, when they finally find the money and he's counting, okay, let's make sure everybody gets a share. And then he counts himself twice. I thought it was funny because, uh, like, when when Zillman shows up with the rest of the group, they're just like, "Who the hell is this guy?" Yeah, <laughs> like he's so like everything he does is so isolated from the rest of the movie that yeah. people are just like, "What? Who is this guy?" I I also loved when he was in the car with that boy who told him like, "Oh, just go this way to um, cross that river," um, <laughs> and then he loses his car in the <laughs> river. <laughs> Uh, and then he just like floats a lot. There's like a musical part or not a musical, but like just some music that's playing to show you what's happening to all the characters. That's terrible. And Zillman's car is just going down the river, sinking <laughs> slowly. <laughs> but Zillman's also featured in probably my favorite like gag part of the movie uh, where he drives up to the gas station and is in a hurry because the he left the truck driver behind and yeah. the. <laughs> uh, like the, he tells the, the 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 gas station workers that this this guy who's coming up escaped from the asylum, yeah. <laughs> and so they uh, like he he eventually drives off, but the gas station workers knock out the truck driver, and when he wakes up, he's just like, "Oh, you want you want to mess with me?" He and begins like one of the the coolest scenes ever. He just yeah. utterly like decimates these these gas station workers by tossing them out. <laughs> yeah, he's. Tosses them around like rag dolls and destroys their entire business. <laughs> it's so it's so funny. It's so like it's uh, it's such utter mayhem in this this movie. Yeah. And it, it's I it's, was very concerned like, for them. Like yeah, you know, like obviously that's just like really great slapstick like comedy kind of joke. Uh, it goes on a little bit too long, I think. Because sometimes, like, there's a lot of times where he's just, like, walking through the rooms that he's already kind of destroyed until he can, like, find them again. And it's, nah. If it was, like, I think maybe 30 seconds shorter, it would have been perfect. Um, but I love that scene a lot. It just needed to be a little bit tighter, I guess, and it would have been great. But, or it would have been fantastic. But, um, like it just made me think like i think i think it's zillman that says not a lot of business here is there okay uh like when he shows up he's just like demanding them to do a lot of stuff here you you put in the gas you need you need to do this not a lot of business here is there <laughs> blah 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 here and uh, fine fellow would you please do this blah 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 like he's such a <laughs> uh pushy jerk to them but they're a lot of the especially the side characters even when like don Knotts comes in 
uh, they're all just kind of like those two in particular are like Tweedledum and Tweedle Stupid. Uh, they're just like they don't really think for themselves. They just do what they're told uh, and then react very slowly to what happens, which is why they get tossed around like rag dolls and their business is destroyed. And they don't know how to tape him very well either. Uh, I, I do find Culpepper, Culpepper a little bit funny. Uh, I like in between all these scenes, you see like uh, like Sar like Officer Culpepper and some other police officers tracking mm. these people, uh, so that because they know that they're lying to them and they're they're trying to uh, uh, like recover the money. Mm. And Culpepper, uh, like he's a uh, like. He's also on the phone with his like mother-in-law and his wife and his daughter who don't mm -hmm. seem to like him at all. Uh, and um, that's sort of like a big thing that happens later in the movie. But one one thing that's really funny is uh, when Melville and his wife get trapped in the uh, the tool uh, building, uh, like Culpepper's like, we should probably free them because, you know, they'll yeah. be stuck. And then like an another officer's like, well, that wouldn't be very fair. And the the look that Culpepper gives that officer, <laughs> like, of, I I hate you so goddamn much right now. And he's like, okay, well, we won't free them. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's it's funny. Yeah, that's funny. I think another part with Melville and his wife that is really funny is um, uh, like he's lit the fuse um to blow up the I, this is after there's a small fire that like destroys the staircase but you can still kind of walk on it uh but he's or maybe i'm mixing things up but he's lit the fuse to use some tnt and he keeps telling his wife don't worry honey it's only a little tnt it'll just go boom and that's it uh and then the fuse um dies because of the yeah this is after the fire it dies because uh some of the um fire extinguisher spray mm -hmm. got on the on the fuse and um uh somehow the fuse starts again i can't remember um but he keeps telling his wife honey i'm just gonna look uh, and she's really worried. Like, be careful. Don't don't go. It, you know, we need to be safe. It's TNT. It's very dangerous. Honey, why don't you trust me to be an adult? I can do things myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. I thought that was so. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, he's like, I think he says, like, why do you think I'm immature? Why do you think I can't do things by, for myself? And then immediately just explosions everywhere. <laughs> uh, eventually they make it to like Santa Rosita State Park. They find yeah. uh, like the big W that uh, Smiler was talking about, which is just trees. Uh, and then like they they manage to dig it up. But Culpepper is like, ah, you got to return that money. And then he like, uh, as they're driving away, he's he just goes another direction. Uh, and they're like, hey, you're not allowed to do that. So they chase after him, eventually make it to like a weird building. Uh, and the chase through the building is really well filmed as well. Yes. Um, pretty, pretty slapstick climbing over each other to get to Culpepper. Um, and then Culpepper like climbs onto a fire escape. Uh, everyone climbs on the money. The money falls and the fire escape breaks. And one of the more sillier aspects of the movie is and and thousands of people watching this from from the ground level collect all the money yeah which did not create a riot somehow <laughs> no uh but uh they, like they all climb onto the the fire department ladder which breaks that ladder turns it into a slingshot uh yeah. and everyone just sort of in the safest but also most dangerous way possible they're flung uh like across the uh the the sort of park that they're in mm -hmm. uh Gil zillman uh one thing that happens to him is he's flung through a window and like lands into like a uh, like a uh, a pull away bed that's in the wall, and then yeah, the yeah, bed yeah, yeah, just falls down. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was like that's insanely like dangerous. They all end up surviving, uh, but uh, they're they're in the hospital, and and Cole Pepper is like, oh, the judge is gonna throw the book at me, but you'll all be safe. Yeah, they're not gonna get punished as as strongly at least because 
Well, they're not going to get punished for the money. They should get punished for all their crimes, which the police have documented thoroughly. Um, but I don't, I, this, I guess this is the scene that made me think like, are the taxi drivers also going to be punished? Cause they just were at the end. They didn't really commit crimes. They just drove these people around, not really knowing what was going on. But then of course the final gag of the movie which I love. I, I didn't like how it was done, but I love that it was in there. Um, uh, Mickey Rooney's idiot um, was eating a banana and threw it. And then the crank stepmother comes in screaming at everyone because only the men got hurt. Uh, and somehow doesn't have peripheral vision to see that the banana 20 feet in front of her uh, is there and she slips and falls on her ass and at this point Culpepper is like upset that this is when he's telling his whole sad life story my wife left me <laughs> my my daughter I'm not going to get my pension I'm going to get hit with the book the hardest my daughter's changing her name everything is ruined I, my pension won't be uh, there anymore blah 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 I'll never have a reason to laugh again and somebody says yeah you will and then immediately, yeah, the banana, the crank stepmother falls, slips on her, slips and falls on her ass, and everyone is laughing up. <laughs> and Culpepper finally cracks a small smile. And and that made me happy because as someone who deeply hates women, I like the <laughs> well character got got uh, got her comeuppance for being a woman. Thank God! Won't somebody think of the men that have to deal with? bitch women that don't know when to stop talking my god finally this woman who's been complaining <laughs> i don't think this movie hates women i just don't think it likes them very much yeah i i don't know i even the other women like they're not as bad but they don't really have an active role in anything and i would dare say they don't have character at all like i don't think they even have a caricature they're just there as props for like uh the seaweed man's wife is literally there to cause tension for uh, she's like a fulcrum point or whatever like uh the balance between the mom and the 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 her husband they're they have character or they have a caricature that is bouncing off each other and the wife is just kind of there barely makes any decisions of her own uh except to stay with her mom, I guess. Um, so there's one, but she's only doing that because her mom is so domineering. Um, Melville's wife, I think she's always saying like, oh, be careful, be careful, be careful. And that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think there were other women in the movie other than the hot girl that was dancing who yeah. has a husband. So she's a cheating, we had a crank we had a cheater. We had a, yeah, a lot of like, not strongly negative other than maybe the, the stepmother, but not great portrayals of women or men, <laughs> but especially women. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it was, it was kind of noticeable. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty much the end of the movie. Yeah. Um, we, we skipped a whole bunch of gags, but eh. <laughs> they weren't that <laughs> we could go over them we could like uh like uh like slice them away one by one and talk about the very act of comedy within the that could have been interesting uh i guess the other one that i thought was kind of funny was um melville uh and his wife when they first charter a plane and melville has no respect for this old beaten down hunk of junk from before world war one and he's i forgot what he's stomping on the floor for but he like falls through <laughs> it wasn't that funny but it was like it was something yeah yeah <laughs> that's the only other gag that really sticks out in my mind that wasn't like the same joke done again uh because it repeats a lot of jokes uh because everyone has one note Everything is one note. Everyone has one character trait, and that's it. Well, I guess it's time to ask, which character do you relate to the most? 
the dirty um, cop or the multiple <laughs> criminals? Hmm, probably Melville. <laughs> Driven mad by money. Melville? Uh, Melville was played by Sid Caesar. Uh, yeah, who's, yeah. Who's also in History of the World Part 1. Mm. Um, good movie. Recommend it. Uh, but uh, I, I like how Melville just becomes increasingly like disheveled over the cor- course of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> like he's this cool, calm guy in the beginning. And then he's just like, he falls apart as everything in, in his life is going uh, wrong, wrong and, and more wrong. Um, so I, I felt like uh, I can relate to the, to the overall experience he's had. What mm. about you? Uh, who, who was the British guy? Uh, Lieutenant Hawthorne. I, I think I relate to Lieutenant Hawthorne because inside of every real, true, masculine man is, is, a, is a British man. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I am American, I, I would have to say that actually I am... I am very masculine and I don't listen to women because listening to women is bad and effeminate and okay. emasculating. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think if, if I'm being serious, um, I I would say like just all of them in general when Zillman shows up at, at uh, Santa Rosita Park and they're like, who is he? Because <laughs> I'm constantly wondering who 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 are... You know, I'm always asking, who do you relate to? So I'm kind of that person, right? Like, who is he? Who are you? I guess I relate to that part the most. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's not really much to relate to because they're not real people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's that's like one of the, the, the issues that I noted. Like, the movie's over long. The scenes sometimes go on forever. Um, mm. to the detriment of the comedy. And then there's too many characters to really uh, like focus on. So you, you have the, the writing kind of suffers of those characters because mm. you're more focused on the, the mad dash, the mad cap um, sort of comedy. There is one more gag that I love that Zillman is a part of. And it's when he's in the car with Don Knotts and he's explaining that he's like a top secret agent. And Don Knotts is just not even saying anything. I mean, he's making some sounds, but you know, just with his very expressive face. Mm-hmm. Oh, what? <laughs> now listen, see, car. <laughs> yeah, listen, see, you got to be quiet. Okay, you get out of the car, and you go make a call, and I'll stay here, and blah blah blah. I'll come back for you. Uh, quick, they're gonna be watching because there's a helicopter that's following them, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Someone's the only one who seems to notice that they're being followed. Yeah. Uh yeah. Zillman's the maybe the funniest character, but mm. yeah, I, I yeah, for all its faults, there are some very amazing things about it. Like just truly mad, like truly bizarre. Why is it shot in 70 millimeters? <laughs> yeah. Why are the chase scenes and the action scenes so good? <laughs> Why did they make a comedy instead of an action? That could have been like I know it's if I know it's like a a, re, a redo of um, Mad War. It's a mad, uh, rat race from 1950s. But like, if they would have just made it a kind of an action film with some comedy, I guess, uh, but maybe just more action. It doesn't have to be like drama necessarily. This could have been kick ass. I think. Uh, like, mm-hmm. keep some of that slapstick stuff. I guess that would have been jarring. But it would have been a lot better than just trying to be funny the whole time. So I kind of wished it was action because that part, that stuff was awesome. And with the 70 millimeter like look, it looked amazing. And they had some great when they were on the scene uh, on location, looked beautiful, too. Mm -hmm. In the studio, not so much, but okay, they couldn't do much then. That's fine. Um, Yeah, but that's all I have to say about this movie. Yeah, just I cut down the characters and like I, I feel like you like it, this movie is allowed to breathe a lot more, uh, mm. and that's that's that that's like the biggest change I would make to this movie is just yeah get, get rid of some of the characters, including Culpepper. I feel like the police were a bit extraneous, um, mm. and you you could have just uh, like replaced them or just not had them in at all, and this movie wouldn't have suffered. It's been a whole year 
of reviewing films around the weird. Mm -hmm. uh, I've chosen six and you've chosen six. This is the end of year one. I know we talked about it before we started recording, but can you believe that? It's unbelievable it's, to me. I, as I said before we started, like I, I didn't realize. I thought we had like a month or so, but um, yeah, uh, appears we didn't. Like it, it just fle flew by because you know we've been watching some high quality movies. Would you say that you? Uh, yeah, we have watched a lot of high quality movies. A few. I wouldn't say anything was truly bad because I did enjoy something about every movie we watched. Um, but would you say that you are a better, more well-rounded person for this experience of year one? Yeah, there's a lot of movies that I probably never would have watched because I've just never known about them. Mm -hmm. um, you probably at some point would have would have found them and then forced me to watch them at gunpoint or something. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> a couple of them for sure. Well, since it's the end of year one, I do believe that it would be best we can keep it brief because we've been talking for a long time now. Uh, but I think it would be a great idea to uh, end this year one before we go into year two and talk about my year two month one recommendation to rank each movie. Just say one or two things about it. You know, we've already talked for a long time. We don't need to go in depth about each movie. We've got now 12 different videos that are all about an hour long to watch all to talk about these movies so you can just go back and watch them uh if you're interested if you're still watching by this point there's uh, a playlist for that by the way yeah, a, there's a playlist a movie review playlist yeah it's some high quality discussions very good ideas coming from uh mr nothing himself and and myself if i do say mm -hmm. so um and some great choices uh great recommendations so i'll i'll let you Go first. Oh, we we can we can say our number one. Should we? Let's go twelve to one. How about that? Okay. And I'll say my number twelve, and then you say yours. You can explain. Okay. Actually, I don't need to explain. This is my least favorite movie. Um, it's just boring. Um, I think it's the same one. Yeah, yeah. We just talked about it for an hour, so I think we get the point. Boring. Number eleven. I, how about you go number eleven now? Oh, number twelve. You mean? Yeah, what's your number 12? My number 12 is Terminator 3. What? Really? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that's not a good movie. That's fair. That's valid. Okay, now why is it... else we watched, it's not as thematically rich. It's not as in, is, as purposeful. It, it, just, it just feels kind of like a hollow, like a yeah. hollow attempt to make something that was far greater at one point. At least this movie was ballsy with what it was, like some of the things that it does um and just like strange directorial decisions that one is a hollow shell of a movie you're right uh okay fair enough number 11 for what did you, you choose for 12 i mean uh mine is it's a mad 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 world oh wow this is my least favorite just because it was the most boring for me uh although i can see terminator 3 being like the least favorite because it is the least I mean, it's the most Hollywood movie we watched, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or the most like mainstream. So <laughs> maybe that says something. Uh, okay, what was your number 11? It's a mad, 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 mad world. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. Mine was The Naked City. Mm. Uh, only because I actually didn't remember watching it, except I remembered the final like scene or the final um, sentence about like, there are 8 million stories uh, and this has only been one of them. I thought that was like a pretty powerful line. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was some, I don't remember watching the movie or what it was about, but I remember thinking like, there's some interesting things going on, but it, it was kind of a meh movie for me. Mm -hmm. Your number, uh, my number 10 Terminator three rise of the machines. Mm -hmm. It had cool action, I guess. And you know, uh, what was that? Uh, what was that quote? Uh, Desire is irrelevant. I am a machine. Mm -hmm. Great line there. Um, had some potential, but it just needed to be its own thing. Yeah, uh, my number 10 is Naked City. Um, so yeah, pretty so we're pretty tied there. there. Now, here's where things get spicy for me. <laughs> You're you not going to like this. My <laughs> number nine, I'm, I'm certain of it. 
Uh, I think, yeah, this is where we start getting into some fights. <laughs> uh, you're number nine first. Andre Rublev. Yes! <laughs> yep. I knew it. <laughs> yep. I, I I thought it had some really interesting parts, uh, like especially that end scene. Uh, yeah. But the rest of the movie was kind of boring. Uh, even even though I understood the point of it all, it, it just... The other movies were spoke to me a little bit more. That's fair. That's fair. I know you didn't have a good time with it. I'm I'm a big fan of slow movies myself, so uh, it spoke to me a lot. Uh, my, <laughs> I think I'm coming out knives drawn as well because my number nine is RRR. Oh, you monster! <laughs> now I want to clarify. Uh, number twelve. 11 and 10 are fairly close with each other, but there is a giant leap up to number nine. The, oh, yeah, the quality of, of RRR is amazing. Like, uh, is like 10, 11, 12 are bottom bottom three for me. And then everything yeah. else, it's like, it's hard to really properly rank. But um, yeah. like my top five is very obvious. Yeah. For well, for me, RRR was the easiest to place. That's the next eight that were a little bit harder. But like, RRR just has the misfortune of like not being my favorite of the rest of the movies we watched. It was awesome. Incredible film, great brotherhood kind of story, cool mm -hmm. Indian nationalism stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it rocked. I love the musical aspect and like, it's an amazing film. It does. The other three don't compare, but it's just got the misfortune of being my least favorite of the other eight. Or the all uh, the remaining nine. Uh, okay, so number eight for me is another film you chose, which is the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Hmm. Um, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but I think yeah, nothing really bothers me. It's just I liked the other films a lot more, and I think uh, the story uh, was not as interesting as some of the others but it had a lot of cool themes and like ideas and the way it presented stuff in you know 1920 is incredible uh mm -hmm. for you my number eight was ghost in a shell it was it was a uh, a good movie um mm. but uh i i feel like its biggest hindrance was it was really short um but for what yeah. it was it was pretty good pretty good action and a lot of stuff to think about like um the like replacing like the philosophy of the mind like w at what point do you remain mm. at what point are you j just the uh the technology mm. um lo lots of important stuff to consider there yeah your number seven my number seven is the doctor of ca uh cap or the the cabinet of dr caligari mm. um so pretty close with both of us fun horror movie especially bizarre ending which i love and uh, uh like it um it would be higher except uh like it, it was more like enmeshed in horror and like didn't mm. really uh it, it, like if it had come out later maybe it'd probably be higher but um for mm. what it was it was very uh sort of experimental sort of mm. my number seven was ghost in the shell so we're just flipped there mm -hmm. uh i really liked the transhumanism aspect of it as well and i thought there were a lot of really interesting things going on with um the main character like changing their body at the end and their voice and and the antagonist and what like everything that was going on <laughs> is very cool but it's kind of short and a little esoteric um you know because it's so steeped in ph philosophical ideas that it's not it, it, i don't think it's too hard to follow but it's just like it's like the good thing about it is it's a movie that warrants like repeat viewing but it's not necessarily the thing that holds it back is like you can't necessarily like understand it fully the first time which is not a bad thing um by any means that's just my thought um number six uh this was a bit tough for me i chose egg and stone mm. um 
Yeah, I, what what can you say about that movie? It, it ripped my soul out, stomped on it, and lit it on fire. I I've never uh, been so like depressed <laughs> in my life watching a movie. Um, it was a really powerful piece, and I we spent an uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable amount of time between this poor girl's legs. Yeah. But it was really effective in what it was trying to say in doing so. So that was a great directorial decision, even though it made mm -hmm. me squeamish. Uh, your number six. My number six is Kill Everyone Now, Pink Flamingos. What? Yes. Really? It's it was it was a hard point. I again I, I say it was a at this point it became very difficult to kind of arrange it. But uh, Pink Flamingos is an exceptionally great movie, but the other movies were like pretty high quality. Like mm. they were, they were really stand out. So I just really liked the like sort of trash aspects of, um, mm. of, uh, let me fix something real quick. There we go. Yeah. I just really liked the, the trash aspects of Pink Flamingos uh, and uh, Babs Johnson, great character, yeah. and of course, um, I forget her name, but uh, the the blue haired woman, greatest hater of all time. Uh, she had red hair. Her husband had uh, right. Blue that's hair. right. I forgot who. I forgot their name. I, my letterbox picture is her. I can't remember who she is either. Uh, all right, that's fair. I mean, we're we're dealing with like all incredible movies at this point, so I, that's fair that it's number six. What's your number five? My number five is Il Gran Silenzio. Uh, fair, fair. Pretty, pretty decent Western, but the thing that stands out to me is that ending where um, uh, like Silenzio is gunned down by the, the villain. Mm. Uh, and uh, the villain just walks away. It's just like, sometimes the bad people win. I, I think this, like... On a maybe I like on a societal level. Well, I'll, when I get to, I'll say this when I get to uh, El Grande Silencio, uh, which I have. Uh, did I not put it on my list? Oh no, no, I did. I, I'll well, I'll say what I was going to say about the ending when I get to it. Uh, number five, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, that was the Battle of Algiers. Mm -hmm. um, incredible story showing both sides of the of of this uh colonial affair um really interesting to see like uh the way the military was operating and that was he a lieutenant he wasn't a general right i think he wasn't a lieutenant was he above that i forgot but interesting to see how the 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 tactics of the military to uh stamp out uh resistance mm -hmm. terrible but interesting to see how it would how they you know operate uh but also really interesting to see how like terrorist cells work and um like how they were how they managed to like yeah operate under this a colonial regime and and uh so Descent and and you know whatever else, amazing film, and also a film where I'm not sure how they filmed certain parts mm -hmm. because it just doesn't seem possible. <laughs> but it was done, uh, at least not possible to do safely. But yeah, uh, my number four was our first one, Autumn Sonata. Um, mm -hmm. man. I never really had this uh, kind of issue with my own mother, but I felt it like I understood, even though I didn't have the same like tense feelings of with my own mother in the way that the mother and daughter in this movie do. But I felt like I have seen far too much <laughs> and I know exactly how that feels, even though I've never experienced it. Uh, and the, the the abandonment issues the um the the way the mother is like kind of uncaring uh to what her her daughter's needs because she cared about her career first oh oof. Oof. 
Mm. Mm. I didn't have that experience, but it it became real for me. <laughs> How about you, number four? Number four for me is egg and stone. Um, Ooh, okay. uh, I gave it two point five stars, or maybe two on on Letterbox. Uh, and like, I stand by that review of my God, is this awful? Uh, <laughs> but like awful in the sense of how uncomfortable it makes me. Uh, mm. so like, but like, other than that, like egg and stone is perfect movie. Um, mm. it's it, like, we see, we spend a lot of uncomfortable time between this girl's legs, but what the movie has to say, like, is right. very valuable is very important. Uh, and like, I, I'm, I I frequently think about it, even though I don't want to. Yeah, um, I still think about it. And you're still a monster for making me watch it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that that's my number four. My number three is RRR, uh, which, um, you know, you, you ranked pretty low. I ranked pretty high. Um, I loved the music. I loved the the acting. I loved the, the story. Um uh, and I frequently find myself like uh, saying, "Oh, hey, I should watch this again." Like, which I, which I only do, like, like, <laughs> like I, I find myself thinking, like, uh, "Ooh, I, I need to watch it again." I only like find myself thinking that with movies I really love. Um, mm. Of those are like Mean Girls, uh, Pitch Perfect, uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, so RR is kind of like with that. It's just, it's just mm. so much fun. It is. It is a ton of fun. I do love that movie. My number three is Il Grande Silencio, The Great Silence. Now, what I wanted to say about the ending uh, was that I don't know which, I, it, maybe it's not fair to compare, but just like on a dramatic, in a dramatic sense or like emo emotionally affecting, I'm not sure if The Great Silence or Egg and Stone has the like more like hearkening uh hearkening ending like damning ending because on one hand you've got the absolute worst situation in egg and stone like a poor young girl who has no escape from the hell that she's forced to live in and on the other hand with the great silence you have like yeah bad guys win and there's nothing you can do about it because they're they they have no scruples they have no morals they're just gonna do whatever it takes to be on top and they will kill you <laughs> they will crush you uh and that i guess i don't know which do you think is like more like damning or or like heartbreaking or like painful of an ending uh, I probably egg and stone, especially because of that, uh, like first person perspective mm -hmm. of watching this young girl give birth, which I only just remembered now. Um, yeah, it's, it's very damning. And like for mm -hmm. a young teenage girl to have to experience all of this, she, all this she gave, she had an abortion, not, she didn't give birth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, for a young teenage girl to have to experience any of that is awful and all the stuff mm. we don't see as well that you're forced to think about is even worse mm. yeah i think that one is like probably the worst ending especially on a personal level but the great silence the way it ends it just if i guess it's more relatable right because it's like a so uh, it's like a sort of making a commentary on a social issue right so it's something that more people can relate to uh so maybe maybe you have to look at it in different ways, but I don't know. I think they're sort of equally damning. Obviously, Egg and Stone, I think, is probably worse because at least in The Great Silence, even though the bad guys do win, maybe if you just stay out of their way, you'll survive and mm -hmm. maybe you'll let your life will be okay. You don't have to hopefully deal with horrible trauma. <sighs> I don't know. Both incredible films. But that was my number three, The Great Silence. Number two. I can kind of guess at this point because of what you haven't mentioned, but. Mm. Um, Pink Flamingos mm -hmm. is my number two. It was a tough one for me. Uh, as I said, when we reviewed it, I've literally never in my life felt so free. This movie 
like looks at all the rules of filmmaking and of like common decent society and says, no, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> we're not going to do that. And of course, it just has so many amazing performances that are very bad acting. <laughs> and just the some of the worst line deliveries. Like, oh my God, somebody sent me a bowel movement. I, lo- <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's so it's so liberating to watch that film because it's just I felt understood. Uh, and I felt like, yeah, fuck the system or whatever. And, or like, you know, just like, yeah, why not be free and live like this? And, you know, what's wrong with that? They're, those people are happy. Like, they're actually happy. Everyone else in the movie is miserable or mm-hmm. eaten. <laughs> All right. What's your number two? My number two is Autumn Sonata, uh, which you rank um, like a little bit higher. Like or like a little bit lower on the list. Uh, I I thought the um, the mother uh, the mother daughter drama was uh, amazing. The camera work was amazing too. Mm. It kind of shot like a play, and then you also see that that scene where the um, the daughter just looks at the mother like the 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 poster essentially. Uh, it's a uh, it was very memorable, and mm. um, the ending was really sad and and like you won't always get that closure that you seek um and you won't always be vindicated as well with your relationship so yeah uh, <laughs> ingmar bergman um solid solid director mm. i guess he was speaking from from his own truth right because mm-hmm. it was about his own feelings about his own career that's how i get i think that has to be how you make good art like it it's just something you know and have thought about so thoroughly and it's just part of you part of him coming out yeah great film uh so your number one drum roll please but uh it's the battle of algiers whoa um, uh just an absolutely amazing movie about <laughs> revolution and you know fighting colonialist oppressors uh like it's really well shot well acted uh, everyone does an amazing job in the movie but the reason that it's number one on my list is because i uh, you know the movies i love most are those that stand the test of time that can you know apply to any time period and the battle of Algiers with with the number of you know colonialist kind of uh uh colonialist what is it um sort of uprisings revolutions that are that are taking place in the modern day in palestine with Mm. um african americans against the um establishment in america and in a variety of other places like this is something that's happening constantly uh and you know there's always that tendency of society to label those people who are seeking their freedom as terrorist um and whether or not you know (laughs) Ter- the terrorist is terrorism you know that remains to be seen but um like you see this still happening and they manage so for the fact that they managed to capture like the human experience so well on in this it's right. like something that you can constantly see happening throughout history um in the mm. future and, and whatnot like it's it's been on my mind for a while and it's like exceptionally great um so that's yeah. why it's number one for me yeah um, phenomenal film it, it's hard to disagree with that mm-hmm. i mean what is yeah. number one for you my friend well it, it can only be one movie which is <laughs> andre rublev <laughs> I, I i feel bad her rating it so low now <laughs> that's all right that's all right i i know you didn't enjoy it as much as me um like I said before, I do like slow films and like ponderous, thoughtful films, uh, especially, you know, if you watch any any other films by um, Andre Tarkovsky, most of them are like that. Uh, maybe Ivan's childhood is not exactly like that, but it's it's like before he found his voice as a director. But Andre Rublev is an early film, still black and white. Um, there's so many amazing things uh, to talk about for each chapter, the, the, but just like briefly, like, uh, when, when the, they come into that tavern and that guy gets, uh, abused by the, like 
the Cossacks or whatever, uh, like the drunk singer saying like terrible things about the emperor or whatever, or the local king or something, um, who shows up a little bit later in the film, if I remember. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, even the guy that was floating, uh, and then there was like a freeze frame at the end in the first chapter, pretty interesting. When the guy is looking for, I forgot his name, uh, the artist, uh, the the portrait, not portrait, what are they called? Um, when you paint like religious figures, portraits, I forgot the name of that. Um, like every chapter spoke to me in different ways. Uh, you know, there's a guy getting tortured uh, seemingly for no reason in that chapter, just in the background, while these two guys are talking about art <laughs> and the human experience. Uh, when the, um, uh, I forgot what those people are called. Um, when those people come in on horseback and raid that village, my God, that was so like powerful. Uh, uh, just the whole thing. And Andre finally like does something that he never thought he would do to protect that girl that he cares about and takes a vow of silence for killing that guy. Mm -hmm. um, and then just like the chapter after that, and the one before that, when he finally decides what he wants to paint, because he doesn't want to paint uh, something to scare people into believing in God, he wants it to come naturally, and it finally comes to him, and then that raid comes, and then he has a vow of silence, and that girl is taken away willingly by, by the people who committed uh, that raid. Uh, or different people, I guess, but same group of people or whatever. And then, of course, the bell. Like, that spoke so deeply to me. I, like, I know it's about the creative process, but it just, to me, felt like the, the act of living. And it just felt so much about, like, not only about being a creative person and creating art, but just, like, what life is like. How you overcome... Uh, your insecurities and fears and and this kind of stuff and like when that kind of stuff happens uh the overwhelming emotion you might feel if you have a great success <laughs> um yeah i just i love it. it and then when it transitions to andre rublev's actual art mm -hmm. oh my god <laughs> just like Perfect ending, put a put a like a capstone kind of thing right there. I just love that film so much. Sounds like a religious experience for you. It was. I fucking love that movie. <laughs> and yeah, I started like making art because of that. I mean, I just making fan art, but I I made this and a whole bunch of other stuff. And that Mother Three video I made, like I literally made that because I watched Andre Rublev. Okay. Well, like, I can always sort of figure out your your thoughts on a movie um, based on because you always like send me like, like, uh, like your comments, like initial comments, like on Facebook. Uh, and like with Ron J. Rublev, you it was just like a nonstop sort of tirade I, of, of great things about the movie. I loved it. The, um, the, 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 the um, sorry, another scene that is amazing and sticks in my mind is the like the reenactment of the crucifixion of Christ in that like just some people going up to the top of a hill and putting a cross. Sorry, go on with what you were saying. Well, I was just going to point out how like with a mad, mad, it's a mad, mad world. Like you were messaging me at like five in the morning yeah. and uh, you were like, I'm two thirds of the way through this movie. And I was like, Oh God, this is not going to be good. Is it? Cause if it had <laughs> been good, you would have started just yelling things at me and that's all i could say i stopped in the middle of the movie that's it <laughs> yeah so that was it, it it's uh it's very telling when like how how you like approach a movie and like what you tell me uh, as you're watching it um but with uh, yeah yeah with uh with the uh, with andre rublev you were like this is dope as fuck i think i wrote a novel to you about it <laughs> mm -hmm, absolutely <laughs> Well, I believe that leaves us with one final thing, which is the beginning of year two, uh, which we will start in May. Uh, and 
you mentioned having a religious experience. Well, buddy, we're not just having a religious experience. We're having a biblical experience. We are going to watch a three and a half hour epic Ben Hur. Ooh. I haven't seen it, never seen it, but I know mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. And we are not going to watch the one that came out in 2016. We are going to watch the, not the original, because there's like a whole history of different Ben Hurs. A lot of them are apparently amazing from the early 20th century. We're going to watch the 1959 version. The that classic. Is one, yeah, the classic that everybody knows that won 11 Academy Awards. We're going back to good films, baby. We are so back. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the the whole the whole like nineteen fifties big Hollywood blockbuster where yes. you have like cast of millions and yeah, um, and you have the whole like uh, queer relationship between Ben Hur and Jesus, which is the only thing I know mm. about this movie. Yes, and um, we've got. I'm, I'm looking forward to queer Charlton Heston, <laughs> who doesn't even know that he's playing a gay character. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't tell. <laughs> it's so funny because <laughs> he wouldn't have agreed to it otherwise. Yeah, um, yeah. But we can talk about that uh, when we get to it. I just want to point mm. out how I forgot that there was a 2016 Ben Hur, as most of America has. Uh, yes. They remade it for some inexplicable reason, and then like no one watched it. Maybe because of the religious right becoming. I mean, it's always been big, but bigger and bigger, and they thought, yeah, we can capitalize on these idiots. I don't know. Mm. But we're going back to Hollywood, and we're going to bigger and better and bolder than ever. The story, a story involving Jesus. <laughs> Gay I, Jesus. I really appreciate this because this is a movie that I've needed to see, and mm. uh, like it's 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 from that era of Hollywood where they they just like like some would say irresponsibly, but. <laughs> millions of dollars into like these these huge product projects and uh Mm. it's it's something that um i feel like most people need to see probably to be honest i kind of wish hollywood would do more of those four-hour epics where they were spending irresponsible amounts of money (laughs) (laughs) that would be awesome and i i would hope that they would be successful uh so that there could be more made because i like I, I was I was between this and the Ten Commandments, but I've already seen the Ten Commandments. Fantastic movie. Uh, but I've never seen Ben Hur, so I chose that one. Yeah, I when you said biblical epic, my thought was Passion of the Christ, but it was also the Ten Commandments. Yeah, um, well, we've already watched Passion of the Christ high together. Mm-hmm. Uh together while we were high. That was a mistake that I will not soon uh make again. Um but yeah, I, I wanted to do um, Ten Commandments because I do love that film a lot. But I thought I've heard so much about Ben Hur, and you haven't. I saw it on Letterboxd you hadn't seen it yet, so I thought we we're gonna start big and bold and brave and dangerous and gay and all that stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, and we still have Charlton Heston, so it's okay because he's Moses in the other one. So. All right. Well, we reached the end of this video um, uh, where we partially talk about it's a mad, mad world, but we also talk about lots of better things. Uh, If you have anything to say, let us know in the comments below. Uh, We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Otherwise, don't forget to like, share and subscribe, uh, not only to my channel, but also Lucas's at the uh, um, at Strike the Sun MD. Uh, He has a pretty high quality video on Mother 3, uh, which I highly recommend that you go seek out. Um, Coming out with another one in a month or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lots of lots of good videos that he's taking his time on. Unlike me, who turns things out like a like a video mill. No, not really. (laughs) Uh, But yeah. um, And also join the discord. Lucas posts there from time to time. And uh, we always chat about video games, books, movies, and stuff like that. Uh, And until then, we wish you the best of luck in your weird and madcap race across uh, Southern California travels. Farewell. Farewell.